Hello, my name is Gretchen Daly, and I'm so glad to join together today across the world to discuss these um, tremendous issues before us. I'd like to just dive right in on the topic of rebuilding our common future and securing a safe, sustainable, and resilient planet for all. And yeah, let's just dive in. So we all know that nature really is at the heart of um, what makes the biosphere livable um, and what brings us security in so many different forms from the material basics of health, food, water, energy and climate, livelihoods, to the more ethereal senses of beauty and belonging. And yet we're still in early stages of learning how to bring nature into the heart of our thinking, into the heart of our decision-making when it comes to planning, to policy, finance, day-to-day -day operations, whether of the largest countries and companies to the very smallest. We know that over the centuries, um, other kinds of capital like built capital, human capital, social and financial capital, we've developed formal ways of capturing those types of capital in our thinking and in our decision-making. When there are big crises, there are at least ways to act that we know roughly speaking how much we value those other kinds of capital. But when it comes to natural capital, many people have no idea what we're talking about. I'm sure we all know here, we're talking about Earth's lands, waters, and the biodiversity within them that drives all of the different processes and services or benefits that make life on this planet possible. So let's just think, what can we... Um, focus on in this short time to discuss together. Um, the most important types of questions really have been put to the fore by leaders in China and in many other countries. And these questions, when looking out across the world that we see as an ever more human dominated place, are firstly, how much and where should we protect nature? Second, how can we secure both people and nature and open up pathways to green and inclusive types of development? And third, in that, how can we move beyond GDP as a metric and system for measuring pro progress? So let's dive into this. We know natural capital is being rapidly depleted at ever escalating cost in the flooding, the fires, the other impacts that we see all around the world today. We know that we can't afford to lose too much of it. We could never survive on the moon or any other known um, type of planet without life. And we know that scarcity confers value in the systems that we have for um, making decisions today. So what are the values of natural capital? Until recently in human history, there was relatively little known on this, apart from in much smaller communities. But today at the global scale, we've really had to build from scratch um, a new, a way of developing a common language, a common way of thinking about the values of nature, and a common set of systems for bringing those values into decision-making. And in some ways, this goes back to the early 1990s when many friends of ours, some shown here from many different places around the world really led in advancing this integration of ecology, of economics, and now more and more crucial fields to form the foundation on which we um, build this system for valuing nature in decision-making. From there, we've been deeply inspired and confidence has been built as more and more real-world pioneering cases
have been advanced. In New York City, which was facing severely declining water quality, we saw an investment in upstream watershed protection. In Costa Rica, which had the highest tropical deforestation rate ever recorded in history, now a country that has invested so much in forest conservation and restoration that there is a net reforestation rate. And China, which faced devastating flooding in 1998, determined that the cause was partly deforestation in the upper reaches of the Yangtze River system and implemented the largest payment for ecosystem services program involving 120 million households around the country. So with these examples, we then came to a time with many more examples coming to the fore in many countries that we could start systematizing a universal approach. So many friends came together um, forming the Natural Capital Project to do exactly that. And shown here, we see some of the main partners, but there are about 400 partners in research and implementation worldwide, all working together with the aim of advancing an engaged form of science that really serves decision makers in many different sectors and geographies using the very latest in technology to um, sense the change across planetary systems and help in computation with data at ever finer scales to inform decision-making all over and drive investments in stewards and in the well-being of both people and nature around, around the world. So we've done this by making the science accessible and actionable, partly on a data and software platform. And through this software called INVEST, we can in any place in the world, look at the value of nature for achieving these different types of benefits and security for benefiting different groups of people in different places and determine answers to those types of questions that I showed a moment ago. This INVEST approach has been adopted by most countries at one level, used in most countries, and we recently launched INVEST for cities, urban INVEST, and that is now also taking off in many different places. And what we see from this, first of all, is that with co-development, with experts from all over the planet, we can develop approaches that are tailored to specific circumstances in different places, but that also drive solutions that can be scaled up. So let me give three examples. First, in Latin America and the Caribbean, we can see water security being addressed by investing in upstream land stewards, such as shown here on the left, who often live hundreds of kilometers away from downstream users in industry, in residences, in agriculture, in energy and irrigation. And this invest approach allows one to determine the return on investment in different places in upper watersheds with different kinds of actions and investments shown here to achieve water quality, for example, under different budget levels. And we can see this has really taken off across Latin America and increasingly in Asia and Africa, here with different major cities at different stages of developing this standardized approach for water security. This has really been advanced greatly with partners such as the Nature Conservancy and here especially the Inter-American Development Bank, um, the former president shown here who has scaled this approach across Latin America. Let's go to the Caribbean now where we see increasing severity and frequency of absolutely devastating storms causing 
great damages to lives, livelihoods, property, and development prospects. So here we can see the software being used to look at coastal risk and determine where investments in coral reefs, in mangroves, and other habitats, other forms of nature would be most helpful in informing decisions for a development pathway that is sustainable and safe. And here, this very island part of the Bahamas was hit by a hurricane as we were doing this work together. But there in the Bahamas, in the country of Belize, and now, thanks to the Inter-American Development Bank, across all 26 member countries with coastlines, we see scaling of this approach for informing investments in nature at the heart of sustainable, green, and inclusive development, development planning. Let me go to a third example in China. And it's hard to summarize quickly, but what I'd like to mention is how China is leading the world in advancing an ecological civilization mindset and institutions to support it. And these involve multiple things. Here I'll just show briefly ecosystem assessment, which could be done in all countries, showing where nature contributes to these different dimensions of security and where these aspects of security are improving or declining. Finding in China that mostly there's been tremendous improvement thanks to ecosystem investments, um, with some decline continuing in biodiversity, but new investments, hopefully enough to reverse those declines. Second, in land zoning and livelihood security, we see China has zoned now over 50% of land area at the national scale for securing these most critical benefits um, to people and paying people in these places, checking that the policies are leading to improvements in human well being, as well as in practices and policy and so on. And then, thirdly, in terms of that third question how to track progress, China put forth a new metric called gross ecosystem product, one that has now been further developed with international cooperation. Gross ecosystem product is something structured in parallel with GDP, gross domestic product, basically the sum of all the goods and services in an ecosystem multiplied by a meaningful measure of their value. And here we have really good measures of some values and in some areas we're developing much more scientific understanding as we go along. But this um, GEP can be calculated in this way, um, bringing in data, using the invest models, and then informing um, people just of the contribution of nature to the economy and society, informing compensation, and evaluating performance of policymakers, other leaders, and of investments. And with this international cooperation in advancing GEP, the UN Statistical Commission approved its use globally. And since then, many countries have raised their hand, Colombia being supported by the Natural Capital Project and Inter-American Development Bank, and now many other countries in Asia, in Africa, and elsewhere starting to implement GEP with support from the Asian Development Bank and other major multilateral development banks, all of whom recently committed in a joint statement to setting out institutional strategic approaches to further mainstream nature into policies, analysis, assessments, advice, investments and operations in just a few years. So with this, all of these banks together investing over $200 billion per year, there's a tremendous 
moment before us for leadership to capitalize on this momentum for mainstreaming, to innovate further in the science, the shared language, mindset, and approaches, and to integrate nature across all kinds of benefits and all kinds of day-to-day -day business operations that will let us scale and accelerate regeneration. Thank you so much.